Thank you very much and good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks for giving me the opportunity to comment on this book. Uh, I want to con congratulate ERF, Ibrahim and Hoda for producing a very hefty book, um, very important topic, timely, and it consists of a large collection of scholarly papers, uh, quite an impressive volume. Uh, and the issues are quite policy relevant. Already the book has been presented and it's based on an effort to answer these three questions about whether there is a resource curse, um, how, how do large wind, oil windfalls interact with institutions in this region, and also how can institutions and policies help avoid the resource curse. <coughs> Uh, I'm not going to go through all the findings and all the details. I want to focus on a few issues, uh, specifically one particular topic in, that I think uh, is important throughout the book. And then, like Shanta, also focus on a forward-looking discussion to see what we, we learn about this uh, what, fr from this book for the future. So the answer to the first question is that, yes, there is a resource curse, but it varies across countries in terms of severity and the type of symptoms that you see. And of course, it concludes, like many other papers in this area, that institutions matter. And in specifically, what is uh, rather specific to this book is that the emphasis is more on political inclusiveness and checks and balances. There are other institutional aspects that other research highlights, but this book focuses on these two aspects. Uh, they also, what is so relatively new here is that fiscal and monetary institutions are brought in and how they interact with oil windfall. Uh, the emphasis is on transparency, credibility, stability, and efficiency of these policies. The area, issue that I particularly want to focus on is the divide uh, among countries of the Arab world that the book emphasizes. GCC countries versus the so-called populous oil-rich Arab countries. We know that GCC countries enjoy substantially higher per capita oil rent, and the book documents that on the whole, although the, their growth rate in terms of per capita GDP is relatively lower, but in other aspects, uh, GCC countries have done much better than the rest, than the populous countries. In particular, if one looks at uh, stability, political stability, social stability, economic stability, they do better. You look at the checks and balances, policy institutions, look at infrastructure, these countries are doing much better than the populous countries. So here's an interesting observation, in fact, that emerges from the book. They don't highlight it the way I do here. But it seems that having more resources is somehow diminishing the impact of the curse. So it's like the Dutch disease that a lot of people would like to have, a lot of countries wish they had the Dutch disease and never get relieved of it. <laughs> and here we have also an inverse relationship between the extent of the curse, the damage the curse does, and the size of the uh, oil wind, wind, windfalls. That has very important implications that one has to think through, especially now that oil prices are going down and may stay down for a long time. So we have less resources. Is that good or bad? So uh, let's look at what the book says about this and then try to derive some implications and look into the future. So, there's a, one chapter in particular that tries to explain why GCC countries have done relatively better. Other chapters also refer to this and, and look at these uh, issues from empirical and theoretical angles. One answer is that they have better institutions to begin with. But we know that institutions are endogenous, and this is also repeated in many chapters. So this is realized that one needs to go a bit deeper. The 
other co answer that the book comes up with is that GCC countries actually transfer a lot more to the population. And what it does is that it allows for, because they have higher rents, they can uh, have greater redistribution, and it helps the government control conflict, violence, and social unrest that one observes a lot more often in the more populous, oil-rich countries of the region, including the events that uh, we've seen in the past several years. One chapter in particular focuses on uh, the labor market implications of the oil windfalls and argues that having larger uh, rents leads to greater public employment and typically with higher wages. So more is transferred through the public employment mechanism to the public and that keeps the social order going without much tension. One, looking at this result, uh, one might ask the question, why can't the populous countries follow similar redistribution strategies? And there's an attempt in the book to answer this question. The answer is this, that when resources are limited under certain assumptions, the elite might find that repressing the population is more cost effective for them as a means of political control compared to the rent distribution. Many assumptions go to this result, into this result and one can actually question any of those assumptions and in fact the result has some implications that make one wonder uh, whether this result is, really holds well uh, if one ex extends the context. One of the issues that struck me when reading the chapters was that some other factors that I think thought should have been brought up and could have been addressed uh, are not dealt with in, in the chapters in the book. For example, think about the role of monarchies versus republics. GCC countries are all monarchies and all the populous oil-rich countries uh, in the Arab world are republics. Does that make a difference or not? Or maybe the oil revenue itself may have led to the outcome of monarchies versus republics. I doubt that uh, because um, the populous countries, a lot of populous countries became republics well before oil revenues started growing in, in the 60s and 70s. And you have three minutes. Sure. Uh, so, also one may ask whether, in terms of political control, the distribution, the trade-off between rent distribution and repression is destiny for these countries. Uh, from the model, one may conclude that if oil revenues go down, countries of the region may become more repressive. Is that the case? Can, or these, these are qu questions that one, uh, should be looking into more carefully for future research and also uh, trying to understand better in terms of what might be done about it. Uh, so one of the implications of the model is that countries with very little natural resources should be very repressive, and we don't see that in many countries. Um, one wonders whether there's some sort of nonlinearity between rent and re repression in, in, across the countries. Uh, I want to actually extend this discussion a bit and uh, point to, the, to another direction, which also to some extent uh, Shanta mentioned. Under what conditions would extending the franchise would be a better option than repressing or redistributing rent. What do I mean by extending the franchise? Developing more inclusive institutions to enable and encourage the non-elite to engage in investment in higher productivity, in entrepreneurship, and that kind of activity may actually bring about more benefits to the elite compared to repression or redistribution. So they can benefit from this. There's a huge uh, literature on this nowadays on extension of franchise and that may be a good way of thinking about it, especially uh, Osamoglu and uh, Robinson have written a number of papers on this in the past 
17 years. So let me finish by suggesting some hypotheses to, to look at, to examine for future research and also derive its implications for, uh, for policy and for research. Uh, low oil prices that are likely to be with us for years to come may lead to the development of more inclusive institutions in MENA countries. And why, would the, why would I think this? What, what's the reasoning behind this? What's the theory? As oil rents go down, the relative value of getting the middle class, the non-elite, to engage in entrepreneurship, to invest in productivity, goes up, and the, bene and the benefits that the elite can get out of that may also increase. As a result, they may consider shifting away from repression and oil redistribution towards motivating their own citizens to do better in terms of productivity. Uh, and some of the research, recent research by Atemoglu and uh, Robinson point out that in order to do this, one needs state capacity. It's a very, sort of, they argue that this is a very important element in this. So, in this situation, uh, the choice between repression versus inclusive institutions, which the issue Achimoglu and Robinson point out in their recent paper, they argue that it depends on state capacity, but also they highlight other factors, especially culture and social norms. So if you have relevant research in this area, that may actually enhance uh, the consciousness, the right, create the right mindset to generate preference for inclusive institutions among the public and among the elite. And that's the end of my presentation.